So I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of a company called Fainboss. Uh, Matt, our CTO, is here with me and, and the rest of the team are based in Cape Town. Uh, we have a, somebody in Istanbul, actually a couple of people in Istanbul um, and, and in Dublin. Uh, we're building a, a, a digital wallet which will connect to the Interledger ecosystem. And uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about one of the features of that wallet. And I guess the first thing you're asking is what is a digital wallet? Because when I tell people we're building a digital wallet, a lot of people, the first thing they ask is, well, what exactly do you mean by digital wallet? Is it Apple Pay? Is it more like Venmo? Is it more like uh, MetaMask? Is it uh, Coinbase, GitHub, Uphold? Um, and I think the, the definition of a wallet is so broad that in fact PayPal has two wallets, right? They have Venmo and PayPal. So uh, for us, a, a digital wallet is an agent of the person who holds the wallet. It's, it's a bit like your browser is your user agent on the web. The way we see wallets going forward and into the future is uh, it's, a, it's a, an agent of yours or your trustee that is a bit like the digital version of that thing in your pocket with your cards and your cash, except it semi-autonomous as well. It can do things to make your life better, to, to participate in, in your online life, interact with services you interact with, and act on your behalf. But it's completely under your control. It's your agent. You choose who you want to be your agent. You maybe build it and deploy it yourself, uh, or you outsource it to someone like us. We run it for you. You configure it. But the, the model is that it's a, it's a semi-autonomous agent of yours that is going to become a, a critical part of, of your life online going forward. And so in that way, it's, it's very different to a bank account. A bank account is something you put money in, you have a card to access it, but really you don't get to control who accesses that account on your behalf, uh, and you don't get, your, your bank account doesn't really get to do anything intelligent for you. So, so it's, it's sort of an evolution of that. Something that um, I think we're all familiar with is, is uh, as a sort of a center of our digital lives is an inbox, right? So we all have an email inbox. That's sort of the center of our online communication lives. And uh, we have other communication mediums, Slack, WhatsApp, you know, various. But they're generally little closed systems. So if I'm on Slack and I want to speak to you on Slack, you have to also have Slack, right? Or, or Signal or WhatsApp or whatever the case may be. But email, its unique property that makes it so valuable and so central to our online communication is its interoperability. So the word interoperability has obviously come up a lot this weekend. Uh, but that's the, key, that's the key piece. And the thing that I want to talk to you about today is, I hope I'm pushing the right button, the big green one, is the email address for your wallet, payment pointers. I'm going to go through five or six slides uh, and talk to you a little bit about how payment pointers design came about, what, why we think they're so exciting, what you can do with them, uh, and why they're so powerful. So everybody knows what UX is, right? No? User experience. So that was a pretty terrible user experience, throwing a big acronym in front of you. And that's a classic example of payment engineers not really thinking about user experience. We're very good at that as engineers. We're very good at building things that are technically elegant, but incredibly difficult to understand and use for everyday people. And so that's become kind of an obsession for us at Fainboss, and, and very fortunate to have a team who share this obsession with me, where very often almost everything, like, or, or, or not everything, but a lot of what we share internally are you know, links to a website or videos or something Look at this awesome user experience. Look how these guys have implemented this thing, or look at this terrible user experience. They could have done so much better here if they just did X, Y, and Z. And I think user experience has been a kind of an interest of mine for probably a decade. Um, and especially finding things that work really well in one context and seeing if you can reapply it in another. So you see a, a user experience you really like, and then you think, well, can we do that you know, in this other context? And a particular example that I was reminded of was probably about a decade ago. Um, I, I got really interested or, or really frustrated initially. The, pro the problem I was trying to solve was sharing payment details. 
So I don't know if, if this is the same for everyone the world over, certainly in South Africa, and I think in the US it's probably similar. If I wanna pay someone, they need to give me their bank details. And I send them, in South Africa we call it an EFT, here an ACH or a wire. It's a, it's a pretty crappy process, to be honest, because first I've gotta go dig up my, my bank account details. I don't know my bank account details off by heart. I don't know if there are any savants in the audience who do. Um, but you gotta go find your bank account details. That used to be a real pain in the ass. It's, it's gotten better, and I think because banks have realized this is a process we go through all the time and the user experience sucks. So these days my, uh, my bank app, I can dig through a few many options and eventually find it. And there's even a share option now where I can share it with people. But then I've got to give that to somebody. I've either emailed it to them or I've written it down for them. They've got to put it into their online banking system or their bank app or whatever the case may be or fill out a deposit slip if we're talking, you know, 10 years ago. And that's how, that's how uh, they actually send me a payment, right? And so I got to thinking, there's much more elegant user experiences for sharing details than that. And the one that I really liked was contact cards. So I don't know if you remember way back when, if you share a contact with someone, you go onto your phone and you find the contact and you say, I want to share it. And it produces this little thing, which is a VCF. It's a, it's a text file format, virtual card format, I think it stands for. And those are still used today. I tried it this morning. I exported a contact from my iPhone and I shared it to, uh, via email, and it was a VCS, VCF attachment. So that really simple process, I was like, can't we just put the bank details in the VCF file? <laughs> and so I got completely obsessed with that. I, I uh, did what all good engineers do when they have a, a clever idea. I bought a domain name, um, openpay.org. I set up a blog, so I did go one step further than most of my other hobby projects. I actually created a website under the domain name. And I started putting some crazy ideas there uh, about using V cards, using NFC to share payment details, and so on. So it's, it's been a, when I say this has been an obsession of mine, I'm not lying. This is like a decade obsession of how do we make payments user experience better. And uh, it didn't really go much further than that. I, I, I joined Ripple soon after that and got involved in Interledger. And, and I guess part of the lesson in that whole process was, was focus. I, I, it, the blog became a whole spattering of ideas. But, but the, the great outcome of that was it, it got me involved in the standards process and understanding how do things become a standard, how do people adopt ways of doing stuff. Uh, and that led me to, to meeting Stefan and Evan and the, the beginning of the Interledger, the Interledger journey. So inspired by that, um, a, few, a few years later when we were thinking about the user experience of Interledger and then looking at existing systems which uh, Arunjay alluded to, to earlier, like pay by proxy, uh, we, we wanted to come up with something similar for, for Interledger. The challenge I have with pay by proxy systems where I use your email address or your mobile number is I'm overloading an existing identifier. So that means somebody has to maintain a registry specifically for mapping that identifier to my account. And then there has to be governance over that registry to make sure that Matt doesn't come along and point my email address at his bank account so that when you think you're sending me money, it goes to Matt. So not ideal, and also because they're overloaded, it makes them not obvious what they're used for. So if I give you my email address, you don't know that you can actually send a payment to it. You don't know if, for example, my email address actually is attached to a bank account on some registry at all. So all of those kind of design rationales led us to payment pointers and, and the use of URLs as, as, the, uh, as the medium for a payment pointer and leveraging what is kind of the most ubiquitous global registry of all, the web. And so you end up with a payment pointer, I'm pushing the wrong button again, that looks a bit like that. So that's my payment pointer at Fainboss and it really is a URL. What we did is we took HTTPS, dropped it from the front, replaced it with the universal symbol for money, the dollar sign, and you've got fainboss.me slash Adrian. And it's got all the right ingredients for not only an identifier, but a really powerful handle into my digital wallet. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in a second. The other trend that has been kind of an obsession of mine for the last decade or so has been APIs, and specifically things like open banking and API access to accounts. I was chatting to Matt yesterday, actually, about a presentation I did in 2014, where I took a, 
a mock-up uh, from the Facebook developer uh, documentation. They have a, a, a page where they were showing how you could log into an app using your Facebook account. And I, I replaced Facebook with Standard Bank, a South African bank, and I replaced the app with a personal financial management app we have in South Africa called uh, 227. And I presented this to a whole lot of banks eight years later, and none of them really do logging in with your bank account. So clearly the, the idea didn't resonate. But it's, it's again, that's been a, a thing that I've been quite passionate about for a long time. And recognizing the value that you can get out of open access to resources of your own. So if I have a bank account, I want to access it through APIs. Obviously, banks have resisted that whole idea, and open banking is, is kind of a, 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 a trend that's taken a long time to really get traction and move. But I think if you look in Europe where it was mandated, uh, some of the innovation that's getting built on top of that is really uh, encouraging. I'm going to take a quick sidebar. Um, I had a debate on Twitter with two people I, I really respect and admire, Dave Birch and um, Simon from uh, Sardine, about banks' role in payments. And it's, it's interesting to think a little bit about why are banks the custodians of payments, right? Because banks' business model is not payments. Banks exist to take deposits and to lend money and to make money on the difference between the interest they charge and the interest they, uh, uh, that you pay, right? So how did they end up being the, the kind of custodians of the payment system as well? And it's almost like an accident, in, in my opinion, because they had the money sitting in their accounts, so it became easier for me to pay somebody by just telling the bank to move the money from my account to their account rather than going and taking it out and giving it to the person and then putting it back in the bank. So banks became the hub in the payment system and the banks started working together when we were doing cross-bank payments and so on and so forth and that evolved. But then politics came along and said, well actually, payments are quite an important part of how we do things like preventing money laundering and preventing uh, terrorism and imposing sanctions. And so banks got given all this extra work they had to do because they had become the de facto custodians of payments and all these extra regulations they had to uh, adhere to. And as a result, we have this regulatory moat that banks all sit behind. So it's kind of a, it's an unfortunate situation because you, you, the, the banks are uh, having to do a lot of work to be banks. It's really difficult to be a bank, but as a result, it's really difficult for somebody to compete with a bank. And so they build all these products and they give us all of these services that are meh, they're not amazing, but it's really hard to offer them if you're not a bank because becoming a bank is so hard. They sit behind that, that regulatory moat. So APIs and open banking are quite threatening to the banks. So all of a sudden, people can come along and build competitive products to what the banks have built. In my opinion, there's an opportunity for the banks to realize like they could stick to their knitting embrace that, let people build amazing products. But sidebar over. The, the, the result of uh, the banks pushing back on, AP, on, on open APIs is you've ended up with fintechs like Plaid, MX, Yodli, and so on, who just went and did screen scraping. So instead of accessing your bank account through an API, they ask you to give them random third-party fintech your online banking password and username. They'll go log in on your behalf store that in a database, and this is not being stored as a hash, right? They have to store it so that they can decrypt it later and reuse it the next time they want to access your account, okay? Uh, and, and all of that has actually resulted in some of the best innovation in the last five to 10 years in FinTech. Those guys are, the, are, are kind of the, the stimulus or the catalyst for so much innovation, and yet they had to hack their way into our accounts because the banks wouldn't give it to them in, in, in the form of an API. Another kind of interesting thought experiment if you think about API access to bank accounts is the original API key is the PAN on your card, right? If somebody wants to access your bank account through an API, the API is called the card networks and the API key is your card number that you give them. And MasterCard and Visa have cottoned onto this. They've introduced new products in the last few years which allow you to not only pull money from your account but push into it as well. So if you want to build some pretty compelling fintech products today using just a debit card, you can. You can forget about the bank. There's a bank account behind it, but you don't even need that anymore. 
So what you're stuck with is API access to accounts is an all or nothing game. You give somebody your login and password to your online banking, or you give them your card details, and basically they have complete access to your account. They can pull all your money out, push all your money in, they can do whatever they like. And what we needed actually is APIs with a proper authorization framework, a way to say, I'll give you access, but only to do these things. And that was the main motivation behind PSD2 in Europe and why the European banks are all starting to roll out APIs. Um, and that was the kind of the early inspiration for the very first version of open payments. So the background on, on open payments was we had this idea of payment pointers, we had a very primitive um, protocol for using them to resolve to an interledger address, but we were sitting looking at what was happening in open banking and we were looking at some of the uh, developments in OAuth 2, which is the authorization framework they're using, and we thought, we can build something pretty cool here that's a lot simpler than open banking and a lot more targeted at wallets and, and, and something appropriate to the Interledger ecosystem. And that was the beginning of the, the, the first implementation of that was Rafiki Money. So if you go to Rafiki.money today, that site's still up and running. And I think there's some plans afoot from the ILF to, uh, to, to bring that up to speed and, and, and for that to run actually the, the latest version of the Rafiki stack ultimately. In the next six months. <laughs> so what you've ended up with with a payment pointer is not only do you have an identifier of your account, kind of like your email address, but it's also the service endpoint for APIs into your account. It's like a double whammy. And the next evolution of that whole process was when Matt and I, after spending a lot of time uh, tra tracking the OAuth work with an IETF, was the discovery of uh, originally a protocol called OAuth XYZ, but what became called GNAP. And GNAP is awesome. What the, 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 the shortened background for GNAP is the people who originally developed OAuth 2 in leveraging OAuth 2 for banking and payments realized its shortcomings. There's a whole bunch of extensions they had to add to make it more secure, um, to facilitate things like uh, granularity in payments. Anyone who's worked with OAuth 2 knows, like trying to figure out what a scope is or how to use a scope is an absolute nightmare. It's a, it's a real blunt instrument. So what GNAP allows you to do is provide much more fine grained control over your authorization on your APIs. So the roles in GNAP are pretty simple and I apologize if this gets a bit too technical, but you've got a client, you've got the, the, the entity that wants to access the APIs, You've got the APIs themselves, the resources, resource server hosting those APIs. You've got a resource owner, the person whose resources are being accessed. So let's think of that as bank, bank account holder and third party. But then the most important person in all of that is the agent. The agent of the resource owner of the bank account owner and that's the, the GNAP authorization server. So you want to access those APIs, you first speak to the auth server and you say, this is what I want to do. This is the scope of what I want to do. This is who I am, okay? And the authorization server looks at you and says, well, as an agent of the resource owner, of the account holder, I think what you're asking to do requires them to approve it. And so they kick off an interaction, they get the owner approval and so on. It's a, it's a really simple and yet really powerful uh, protocol for negotiating authorization. And that's, the name stands for grant negotiation and authorization protocol. And I think one of its most powerful features is the way it does interactions. So when you ask for access to a resource, so you, I've given you my payment pointer, you've hit that payment pointer and you've said, I wanna send a payment out of Adrian's account. What you do in that request is you say, and by the way, I have Adrian here on my website right now. As the client asking for that, I can actually redirect Adrian to a page, or Adrian's on my app, so I can ask him for a one-time pin. You, you can specify all the ways that you can interact with, with the client, at the, with the, the resource owner at that time, the account holder. And the auth server can come back and say, well, based on what you want to do, this is how I want you to interact with them. And right now, the, the protocol has a few very basic interactions, but there's some really, really exciting um, ways that this can be leveraged, especially in payments. The other interesting thing about NAP is there's nothing stopping a single authorization server issuing access tokens to multiple resource servers. So I could have a wallet 
that issues access tokens to my other crypto wallet, to my bank account, to a server that I self-host, which has some identity credentials on it that I'm only prepared to share with certain people. So it's a really powerful model where the, the AS, the authorization server, can sit and act on behalf of the, the um, wallet holder or the payment pointer owner and, and issue tokens for access to all of these resources. I think um, the, the one example of the interaction mode, which I think is worth mentioning, is there's some work at the W3C at the moment called Secure Payments Confirmation, where within the context of making a payment on your, on, in your browser, you can actually use WebAuthn. So if anyone's ever been on a page online where they've been prompted to use Face ID or scan a fingerprint or use a hardware key, that's a technology called WebAuthn. Normally the way that works is it's just logging you in. So it's signing a random challenge. The server sends a random challenge, your hardware key signs it and sends it back and that's proof that you are who you are, that's your hardware. Well, they've taken that one step further and they've said, we're gonna sign a whole transaction. We're gonna put the details of the transaction in there and that's what you're gonna see and you're gonna scan your fingerprint or, or do a face ID and you're actually gonna send a signed copy of that transaction back. Now if you submit that into your GNAP auth server, no further interaction required. You don't have to do a redirect. So you can imagine the online payment checkout flow goes from you know, redirect three or four clicks. Forget one click, this is zero click. Zero click checkout. It's faster than fast. Inside joke. Um, so I think the, the potential with GNAP is really powerful and, and I really love the model we've ended up with with payment pointers you know, pointing you in to this ecosystem and, and, and being kind of the entry point into this protocol. There's a whole future ahead of, of things we still have to explore what we can do with GNAP. GNAP supports uh, user info sharing as well. We haven't really even scratched the surface of that. So part of your request that you make to the server for access to a resource can also be request for information. So there's a whole bunch we can explore there in terms of sharing compliance data, sharing other data. If you, if you go and have a look at our um, YouTube channel, you'll see we've got a concept video of an e-commerce flow. If you look very carefully on the last page of that checkout flow, you'll see on the consent screen that the user is not only consenting to pay, uh, I think it's $24 or whatever it is, they're also consenting to share their email address and their shipping address. So they only had to type in their payment pointer, that's the only data they entered, but the shop got the payment authorized, their email address and their shipping address, all as part of that interaction. So these are like really exciting flows and interactions that I think we still, we still want to explore a little bit further with GNAP. I'm running out of time and I, I said I was going to be short. Last slide. The other really cool thing about payment pointers, and I think one of the things I like the most about them is that they're part of the web. I love the web. Final sidebar, app ecosystems suck. Sorry. <laughs> Mobile app ecosystems are closed, uh, closed gardens, closed ecosystems where the mobile system operators have leveraged the, the, the fact that they don't allow other people to offer stores on their platform to kind of corner the market. So when you build an app for the Play Store or for the App Store on, on uh, iOS, you get all these fantastic benefits like the App Store deals with payments for you and it deals with identifying the user for you but you pay a nice fat tax for that. It's been in the news obviously the last year or so and a lot of people pushing back on that. If everybody just built for the web, they wouldn't have to deal with that. If we all just focused on making the web platform better, we wouldn't have to deal with all of that crap. So, sidebar over. Last few points on payment pointers in the web and why they're so fantastic. Uh, a payment pointer is a URL. The great thing about the web and HTTP and URLs is you can do more than one thing with one URL. So if I gave you my payment pointer, you can get that payment pointer, but you can also post to it. So let's say you want to fetch that payment pointer, you can get back information about the payment pointer. Whatever I choose to share with you, it could be a public name, it could be uh, some information about who I am, it could be a pointer to somewhere else where you can go and find that. Whatever I want, I can share with you at my payment pointer. But that payment point is also an entry point to an API interaction. 
So instead of getting, you can post. You can post your authorization request to that same URL. I didn't have to give you a whole bunch of information. This is where you go to get information about me. This is where you go to access my APIs. It's all the same URL. So I think that's a pretty cool uh, aspect of HTTP that we can leverage with payment pointers. The second, which kind of feels a little bit like a, a superpower and underappreciated one of HTTP is a thing called content type negotiation. So we already use this in SPSP and I'm getting deep in the weeds of the ILP technical stuff. But something that you can do with HTTP is with the same URL, you can ask for different forms of content. So I can go to a payment point in my browser and I can see a page because my browser is telling the server, this is a human. Give them something that a human can interact with. So I get an HTML page that says, this is Adrian's wallet. Do you want to send him some money? What do you want to do? But if it's a machine and they send the request and they say, give me back the response in machine readable JSON, I get back a completely different response. I get back the response to an authorization request. So that, that allows us to do some really cool stuff. And I, and I think a, a good example, because I'm running out of time, is this mug that we gave everybody in their bags. If you didn't get one, I think there's still a few left. So every single mug that we made has a unique QR code on it. That QR code is a, a payment pointer. But it's not a payment pointer yet. Because it's a URL, there's so many flexible and cool things we can do with it. If you visit this URL on your mug today, you'll end up on our waitlist page. But when you sign up on the waitlist, we'll have linked this mug to your account. So as soon as you activate an account, You've now got a payment pointer that points to your Fainboss wallet that's also on this mug. So next time you want somebody to pay you, you just get them to sign your mug, scan your mug, and that's a, a pointer to your wallet so you can get paid. And that's a pretty cool use case that you just can't do with, I don't know, a bank account number. 